Te da koto te fado o akla yudatari. Te da koto na manaviri. No mai hara mai hara mai ki te de fare kara kia a te atua. Te da koto te da tato katoa. For 116 years, Unitarians have been building a house of dreams in this space. If you're a guest or visitor or seeker here for the first time, welcome to our dream house. Dory Summers describes it this way. We, all of us, build houses for our dreams. The masonry and lumber, glass and tiles, a solid form wherein we see our hopes, a shelter and protection for our growth. This house shall be a dwelling place for courage, for integrity, for love, engendered, nourished by a family that speaks of we and means all humankind. These walls shall represent the privacy and dignity of individuals, the open doors a welcome to all people, all ages, and all generations. The windows shall keep light of inquiry, illumining from outside and within. May all words spoken here be born of love and energy rekindled in the hearts of those who dreamed this house, who plied the tools and paid the price to actualize the dream. May dreaming never cease for those within who know the world to be a troubled place but dare to struggle with imperfection, imperfectness toward that brighter hope, that better day. Let memories add warmth, a heritage, a quilted patchwork stitched with history of kindliness, of daring for the good, of funny moments, jokes, and smiles, and tears. This is a precious place as every home that shelters those who love and strive and share. Its blessing is in lives that meet within, in living, learning, caring, sheltered here. This morning, we continue building our house of dreams. After the service, I invite our guests to join us at morning tea. It is our sacrament of hospitality. I especially want to welcome our speaker, Craig Hoyle. Raise your hand. No. <laughs> Craig is a journalist for Fairfax Media. Do I have that right? But recently rebranded stuff or something. <laughs> Uh, this is not his first visit with us. The first time he was here, he shared his journey of coming out in a conservative brethren family. He has also been here as a journalist at times when Auckland Unitarians were making news. We're delighted to welcome you back, Craig, and your partner, Dan. You notice that Craig entitled his talk, Why Should We Care? Before asking why you should care, perhaps it would be worth thinking about the fact that you do care. Human beings are emotional and moral beings. We simply aren't capable of observing other people's behavior without reacting emotionally and morally, though not always rightly, to it. Because we are good at thinking, we can learn to override our initial emotional reactions and behave as detached scientific observers in certain circumstances. But this requires an effort, even if we don't recognize it as such. We care about other people because we can't help it. When we cease to care altogether, we cease to function as humans. The important question then is how we live with caring about other people 
given how painful and demanding it is. There are those who say they don't care, or if they do, it's because they get something for doing it. We like this chalice because caring is intrinsic to be a Unitarian. Why light it? And now I'd like to invite Craig forward to share, share his thoughts with us. Welcome. Hello. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Um, now I haven't actually written a talk for today. Um, I did write some notes at work yesterday. I actually walked around the newsroom asking other journalists and editors why we should care, and wrote some notes. I have brought my notebook, which is more than I did the other day when I went to interview the Prime Minister, and for the first time ever as a journalist, I forgot my notebook. <laughs> and the only piece of paper I could find to write on was a parking ticket. <laughs> um, so I was at the Prime Minister's house with my phone and a parking ticket on the back of my phone, trying to fit all my notes onto the parking ticket. Um, <clears throat> so we're one step ahead of that today. Um, now, I see a few familiar faces. I guess a lot of you would have heard what I had to say last year. I'll just briefly recap how I got to where I am today for those of you who don't know the story. So, as Clay mentioned earlier, I grew up in the Exclusive Brethren Church, um, which is... Fairly fundamental, very conservative, um, no TV, no radio, no social contact with the outside world. Um, you're born into the church, you go to a church school, you work for a church company, you go to church every day of the week, you marry someone from the church, and so on. Um, my family had been in the Brethren for seven generations. Um, <clears throat> now, I realised when I was a teenager that I was gay, and it was never going to go well in the Brethren. Um, now, I came out as gay to the priests when I was 18, um, and they spent about 18 months trying to change my sexuality, um, clearly unsuccessfully. And <clears throat> I left the Brethren not long before I turned 20. Um, now, leaving the Brethren... Um, means you're excommunicated, so I um, haven't had a lot to do with my family since then. My parents threw me out, and they actually waited until I was away for a few days and then emptied all of my belongings into a storage unit and told me to pick up the key. Um, <clears throat> but it was back in 2009, and around that time, a film crew from 60 Minutes um, got in touch. They were working on a story about something else and found me through a friend of a friend of a friend, really. Um, 60 Minutes did a documentary about my story in 2009 as I was leaving the Brethren. Um, the reporter was a woman called Sarah Hall. Um, a few of you may be familiar with her work on TV. Um, <clears throat> now, Sarah and the producer, Charlotte, really went out of their way um, to look after me, to make sure I was okay. In addition to doing a story about what I was going through, they took the time to sit down and ask what I wanted to achieve with my life and what I was passionate about, what my strengths were, then took me into TV3 to meet their manager um, and, <clears throat> following on from that, recommended that I become a journalist. Um, and TV3 actually backed me into the degree at AUT and 60 Minutes gave me a job. Um, and <clears throat> Sarah and her husband, not content with having looked after me and backed me into a career, then took me on, really, and became adoptive parents. Um, and so Sarah, to me, has been a role model of what a journalist should be about. It's about 
going into the community and telling those stories, but also going that extra mile and caring. Um, <clears throat> so for the past however many years it's been, eight, nine years, I tried to model my journalism on Sarah's because she, to me, was the ultimate example of why we should care, um, because we all have the power to make a difference. Um, <clears throat> now, I was at MediaWorks for five years, working in TV and radio, and have been at Fairfax, or stuff as it is now, for the past 18 months. Um, I'm a senior reporter with the Auckland Bureau, and I'm on the social issues round, um, which basically involves going out and talking to people, um, finding out what's going on, looking at different social issues, and then writing about them. Um, it's my dream job, really. I get paid to go and ask questions about things I'm curious about and then tell other people about it. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things about being a journalist is that you're exposed to a lot of different ideas, a lot of different ways of thinking. Um, and I, I often think if I wasn't a journalist, I'd be quite oblivious to some of the things that go on in the rest of the world, or even just the rest of Auckland. Um, <clears throat> and what really brought it home to me a few months ago was um, we were doing a series around the election and one of the, the one in five million project. Um, so a bunch of us around the country were told to go out and interview ordinary New Zealanders and find out about the different lives that people are le leading here. Um, and one of the people I talked to was <coughs> a solo mother in South Auckland. Um, she had five children. Um, she wasn't a solo mother by choice. She'd been married. She was a stay-at-home mum. And her husband had left her. <coughs> and she said to me when I was interviewing her, she said, if I'd known I was going to end up a solo mother, I would never have had children. Um, <coughs> and talking, about, talking to her about what her life was like, and one of the things that really struck home was she said she <coughs> locked her groceries in the boot of her car because it was the only way she could make sure they lasted the week um, because food was so tight that she actually couldn't afford to have the kids come home from school and eat an extra slice of bread. Um, and <coughs> came back and were in Ponsonby that night, actually, and um, we were at Mu Cha Chao, I think, which is now closed, which is a great loss to Ponsonby. But <coughs> realised when the bill came that the bottle of wine we'd just drunk with dinner cost more than what her grocery budget was for the whole week. Um, and that's more a reflection on what her grocery budget was than the wine we were drinking. Um, but it was a, a, a reminder, really, that there are people out there living lives that are very different to mine, very different to ours. Um, and <clears throat> for me, it's a real privilege going and hearing those stories. It's the same thing with natural disasters. You hear about it on the news, but you go to these communities, as in... Kaiawa recently and you go knocking on people's doors and for all that there's this talk about people not trusting the media generally in times of hardship or struggle or disasters pretty much everyone will welcome a journalist into their house and talk about what's happening and to me that's a huge privilege because we can't all be everywhere all the time and for my colleagues and I um, <coughs> we have a responsibility to act as eyes and ears um, for the rest of the community. And <clears throat> for a lot of people, talking to a journalist is sometimes the first time someone's taken them seriously or they've been um, trying to achieve something, they've been fighting for justice. Um, and <clears throat> people... Um, I, th I think there's a belief sometimes that people go to the media because they want attention... And in my experience, it's almost never the case. People go to the media because they have no other option. Um, they've tried everything else. They've, they've fought for justice and they haven't got it. And sometimes the only way to get justice is to bring it into the public domain. And I'm sure the same thing would apply. The Indian students who were here last year, you can file applications in court and you can write to ministers and so on, but... It's not really until it's in the paper or on TV that the country takes notice um, or the ministers start responding. Um, <clears throat> so it's a real privilege in that respect. Um, 
And it's that diversity of views, I think, as well, um, that we have access to. Um, I've had a number of discussions with Clay and various other people about things like this. Um, I've spent a bit of time, very different to the Unitarians, but I've spent a bit of time with Destiny over the past few years. <laughs> um, when, I, when I arrived at Stuff, um, I was told there was an endless appetite for stories about Destiny and the Tamakis. And <clears throat> I thought, well, what better way to write about Destiny than to get to know the Tamakis? And so over the past few years, I've had a bit to do with Brian and Hannah, and I would say become reasonably good friends with them. Um, now, we disagree on almost everything. Um, but to me, it's really important. Um, I think part of caring about other people is caring about people that you disagree with um, and reaching out to bridge those gaps um, because I think that having a dialogue with people like that is much more helpful than um, condemning to the trash heap, as it were. Um, but <clears throat> that's been an interesting experience. Um, because I've found that people are almost always more nuanced than you'd think um, and that um, the Tamakis, for instance, have never been anything but welcoming and have never been judgmental really either. Um, we disagree, but Hannah says to me, she says to me a few times, um, she says, I play basketball and you play netball and there's no use trying to get each other to agree to the other's rules, so we'll just play our separate games. Uh, <laughs> um, but <clears throat> one of the things that came from that, you remember the business with the earthquake comments, um, which a number of us were supposedly responsible for around the time of Kaikoura. Uh, um, was... Um, <clears throat> Yeah, not perhaps not the best wording of a sermon. But um, following that, I thought, well, there must be some way of bridging some differences here. And so I took Hannah Tamaki out for coffee with the executive director of Rainbow Youth. And I said, well, have it, we'll just all sit down and let's have a talk about it. Um, <clears throat> and there was a lot more in common than you'd think. And that's always the case, you know. I think often we meet people and we focus more on our differences than what we have in common. Um, <clears throat> and so that's a, been really important to me as a journalist is approaching people that I disagree with and finding out what they think. Um, it's harder to reach common ground with some people. I interviewed Logan Robertson once or twice. He's the pastor who thought that gay people should be stoned to death. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> bridging difference is sometimes easier said than done but um, I think I'm just looking at my key words here going around the newsroom yesterday and I've got informing justice, truth and facts um, <clears throat> I think bridging difference is one thing being able to tell other people about it is an even greater privilege and very aware of that. Um, there's been a lot of talk about fake news recently um, and increasingly it's something we're dealing with at work. Um, fake news is one thing but people are using the label to talk about news they don't like um, and you think just because, just because you don't like a story or just because you don't like the way it's been told doesn't necessarily make it fake news. Um, but justice is a big thing for us. It was something that almost all the other journalists in the newsroom talked about, um, shining a light on things that need to be um, focused on. And <clears throat> that, to me, is, I think, really why we should care, because justice for ourselves is one thing, but justice for all of us, including the people that we disagree with, um, is more important. And so that, I guess that would be the key theme of my talk here. And the key theme of being a journalist really is that it's important to care and it's important to care about everyone. Um, and the more we can reach out to people that we disagree with, I think the 
closer we'll be as a community. I'm happy to take any questions. I think something as a journalist, you really have to set aside your own personal views. Um, yeah, I, a lot of the people I interview are people that I disagree with, but it doesn't mean that I can't have a good conversation with them. And Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I don't know. I think in that case I was just so, so curious about what he had to say um, that I was just, it was more a, a curiosity, really. Um, <clears throat> with things like that, it's a lot, easier to, a lot easier to interview people like that when you know they're a minority. Um, if he represented a majority of New Zealand, I'd be more concerned. Um, and I think dealing, dealing with the fringe is easier when it is the fringe um, because you know that most of the country disagrees with them. But it's an interesting question. I mean, we often debate in the newsroom whether we should ever do stories about, say, white supremacists in New Zealand because they do exist, um, or <coughs> flat earthers. It was a vigorous debate we had the other day. <laughs> um, but, <coughs> look, I think... You can interview people like that and tell these stories in such a way that you're clearly not endorsing what they're saying. And if you can sort of demonstrate without directly criticising them that what they're saying is wrong, then you can find a middle ground. Um, hi, Craig. I'm, my name's Rachel. I'm a trade unionist, and we're in the business of redressing imbalances. And I just wonder if you can talk about journalistic balance. I mean, your last answer probably partly answers it, but the thing I fear with journalistic balance is that if you give equal voice to the powerful and the powerless, the powerful are still more powerful than the powerless. And, you know, how does balance work? Hmm. What's the nuances in balance? <clears throat> it's an interesting question, and I think one of the fallacies in the past in some areas of journalism has been that you have to give both sides of the debate... Um, 50%, um, which isn't always right. Um, <clears throat> it's an interesting question. I th first of all, talking about stuff, the company we work for has a fairly strong focus on redressing imbalance. Um, so it's, um, our CEO is committed to closing the gender pay gap. Um, and they've also been going um, town by town, bureau by bureau, seeing which countries, which cities have the greatest um, gender pay gap, um, where people, where it's related to age, where it's related to tenure. Um, <clears throat> so I think most media companies come from a place of sort of addressing that imbalance. But it's an interesting question, holding the powerful to account. And it's very easy and... One of my observations has been that often people who are trying to take on the powerful, they're very easy to discredit because, in general, people believe the person in a position of power. And I did a story about a woman recently who said that the assistant police commissioner had threatened to kill her in his office, um, which sounds ridiculous on the face of it. And... For years, nobody believed her, and eventually they finally got around to interviewing her friend, and her friend completely backed her version of events. She'd been in the same room. But the same thing, you have these people trying to take on someone powerful and draw attention where there has been wrongdoing, and they get so angry that no one's listening that, in a way, their, their anger makes it easier to write them off. Um, <clears throat> and by the time they approach a journalist... They, they do sound a little bit crazy, some of these people, because they're so angry and they have such a sense of injustice and you really have to work through it with them to figure out um, what the actual nub of the matter is. But <coughs> trade unionism, um, there's always going to be an imbalance of power and I guess the people who have less power... Um, I guess have to get creative and I think the unions certainly do get creative I think the advantage that the powerless have is that in 
drawing media attention, um, there'll always be one side who's got more to lose through public attention, and it's almost always the powerful person who's got the most to lose through public attention. So in a way, I think by getting something like that into the public eye, you're going some way toward reclaiming that power and balance. Does that make sense? Hi, I'm Craig too. Hi. Um, it would have been a time, certainly in the perhaps 70s, early 80s, um, as a teenager, where I felt I could pick up a newspaper and I could pretty much believe everything that was written in it. I'm not so sure now. Um, I'm much more discerning when I read the news now. And I can't help feeling now that it's more about selling the news than actually reporting the news. Um, stories getting embellished or um, exaggerated to get people's attention so that they buy the newspaper, watch the TV program. I don't have the same trust in the media, n mm -hmm. nearly as much as I used to. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I think that's a fair criticism, first of all. Um, and I, I think it reflects society as well, because until very recently, it's only been in the last 50, 100 years, until quite recently, everything you read, you believed. Um, <clears throat> generally, things weren't published that weren't true. Um, whereas with the rise of the internet now, you can put anything out there, and there has been an increase in information that has been put out there specifically to mislead people. Um, <clears throat> partially also that I think society is becoming more discerning I don't think the news is necessarily any more shocking now than it used to be. Or, you know, you read newspapers from a hundred years ago; the headlines were just as lurid, <laughs> depending on the newspaper. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's a good thing that society has become more discerning and that people are able to critically analyse what's been said. And I, I think also people people expect the news to be objective, and it certainly should be. Um, but I, th I think it's important to acknowledge that every, every journalist, every person who works in the media has some element of bias, and it's not about trying to ensure that you don't have bias. I think it's more important to acknowledge the bias you have and work around it, and if you're worried that your bias is affecting a particular story, to discuss that with an editor or with one of your peers. Um, <clears throat> but it's fair enough to call out a journalist and to ask questions about how a story came to be and often will write stories and then get emails from members of the public saying well hey what about this and in some cases it might not be something the journalist was aware of or something that hadn't come to our attention before so I think there's much more of a um, journalism now is much more of a two way street, there's much more engagement from readers um, and so if you don't believe or agree with something then by all means get in touch with the journalist and most of the time they'll reply um, so <clears throat> yeah I, th I think that engagement is important, does that answer your question? perhaps not but um, I'm David Hines I'd like to um, uh, say how much I've appreciated what you've said uh, I'm a journalist myself and, and I've always um, agreed with the kinds of um, goals that you've described and, and I, although I um, also often got flack for being biased, I would say that the, um, it is not hard to find a large number of journalists who are not biased and who do, who do care. And um, I, I think people who write off the whole profession um, need to look at it more discriminatingly. Um, there are plenty of caring journalists in most of our media. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Hi. Tina. Thank you for really in, an inspirational talk. I really enjoy listening to you. Um, I've been in New Zealand for a little over a year, and I do. F I would say that the media, from and I read a variety of different things, seems to care a lot. There's a lot of caring out there, but the caring is always like there's always a human interest side. I find that there. 
there seems to be a spin every, every time. Like we need to find a person that, you know, we can then hang the story on. And a lot of attention is given to if people put out a, a give a little page, you know, and then so. On the one hand, I think it's really nice to have all these stories showing how people care and how society comes together. At the same time, it also bothers me. It bothers me because it seems to individualize what are systemic issues. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you see the New Zealand media um, and its role and, and how maybe even, if you can, compare it to international uh, uh, trends. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> it's an interesting observation, and you're absolutely right. Um, any time any journalist writes a story, and if it's just about facts and figures, the editor will always come back and say, who's the human face of this story? Go and find a case study. <laughs> so you're, you're absolutely right. Um, <clears throat> I think if you look at stories, that's a response to the audience, and I can't speak to international audiences, but audiences in New Zealand um, overwhelmingly will respond to a story um, <clears throat> if there's a human face. Um, if it's just facts and figures and data, people will read it. Um, but everybody, you know, everybody knows there's a problem with poverty. Everybody knows there are people going hungry but then when you hear about an individual mother who's locking her groceries in the boot of her car, that resonates with people. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, look at that story. Um, after we published that story, um, a flood of people got in touch with us. Um, and these were people who had read about this mother and wanted to help. And then people donated money, people donated groceries. Um, and there were some really heartwarming stories, like a couple got in touch and that was their wedding anniversary and they'd talked about it and they had decided that it would be more meaningful to them to donate the money that they were going to spend on the anniversary dinner to her to help her feed her kids. Um, and there was a, an Indian guy who got in touch and he said he'd been in New Zealand for five years and New Zealand society had given a lot to him and reading about this mother had really touched him and he wanted to take up a collection at his workplace to help her to give something back to New Zealand um, <clears throat> but you just don't see that kind of response if there isn't a human face to the story um, so I think that's it's playing on emotion and it's about what Clay was saying at the beginning about you walk past and you see someone else's situation and you can't help but respond to it whereas if you walk past and see some facts and figures it's a lot harder to respond emotionally. Um, so it's, I think it's a reflection of sort of human emotion. But I completely agree with your point that people should be focused on the wider picture. So sometimes that human face can be a route to showing what the wider picture is. Well, I alone have about five more questions, but I think we're going to have to court buttonhole you at morning tea ask about them. Uh, thank you for your questions, but thank you, Craig. Let us... To wish for compassion, to pray for courage, to bear sorrow, to strive for sureness, all these qualities are a facet of caring for which each of us should be grateful. But to feel a genuine fellowship for the whole human family, to act so that our caring is evident wherever we go, that's the object. That's the lifelong goal. <clears throat> 